Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the CPC Speaks podcast. Today, we have a great guest, Dr. Aaron Zerbo from the Rucker Center, uh, Center of MAT Excellence. Hope that, hopefully, I pronounced that right. MAT being medication assisted treatment or medication assisted therapy. So, um, just a little background. So, I've seen Dr. Zerbo speak many times, uh, and I'm going to let you all decide what you like about her because I obviously am a big fan. But the one thing I can guarantee is I've seen, I must have seen you 10 times speak, but every time I see you, I get something more out of it. And I'm not just saying that. Like, I really get a lot out of listening to you speak about addiction. The perspective is refreshing and it's, it's, it, people need to hear it. So I'm very, I feel very privileged to have you here. So why don't you introduce yourself a little bit and if you want to give a little bit about your background and then we can get started. Thank you so much. That's such a beautiful introduction. I'm so flattered. Um, I'm an addiction psychiatrist at Rutgers, New Jersey Medical School, and I'm an associate professor in the Department of Psychiatry there. And then a couple years ago, we got the, a grant from the State Office of Medicaid to found our Center of Excellence, and so I'm the director of that. And so that's how I ended up meeting Ken and working with him. Right. <laughs> and the first time I, I've ever, I saw you speak, I can't wait it afterwards to come up and talk to you, which is something I don't normally do. I was like, I got to meet her because I want to learn about what she's got to say. So that was for several yeah. years ago now, pre-COVID, but here we are. So so, yeah. so, just, you know, I've been in the addiction field over 25 years now, since the early 90s. And I don't, you know, I don't need to tell you how much it's changed. You know, it was very 12-step dominated back then. And nothing against the 12-steps. When that works, it works really well. When people, that's what works for them. But there's so much more than that we've learned now. And I'd like to be able to, you know, to, to have the audience get a chance to hear your, what you have to say about, like, just knowing addiction, how do, how do we look at it today? What's the best way to kind of, people can to understand addiction in the perspective, the modern perspective of addiction that we've kind of come to learn through science and things like that. Yeah, exactly. Um, so basically it's this, it's this idea that addiction is a brain disease. And I think it was in 2000 that there was like an article published by um, the head of um, NIAAA at the time saying like addiction is a brain disease. So it was like kind of this big shift that was happening in the 90s, but really revved up in the 2000s. And it was basically a lot of neuroscience researchers have been doing this research since the 80s. And I, I like to start by thinking about, um, I read this interview with Nora Volkow, who was the director of NIDA, and she's you know, a huge researcher, been really instrumental in the field. And she was talking in an interview about how in the 1980s, she was working in her imaging lab and she would have people addicted to cocaine come in and they would say, I hate using cocaine and I don't want to do it anymore, but I can't stop. And back then we only had this idea of pleasure pain principle. And so it was an idea that if you're addicted, you like love the pleasure of it. So you just keep doing it because it feels good. So we had no explanation why people would keep using if it's not pleasurable anymore. And so that really piqued her curiosity and she and a number of other researchers did more research. And we basically figured out that there are brain changes that happen with repeated use. So if you just use a drug of abuse once or twice, you cannot get addicted to it. It's just gonna create that euphoria and you'll have you know, whatever feelings in your head, but it's not gonna create compulsive behavior. The compulsivity comes from repeated doses over and over and over. And then you start to get these new proteins that get formed that are very long acting and they go to other parts of the brain and start to rewire. So what we basically learned is that this whole idea of the reward pathway, which is in our primitive cortex, and that's kind of what's getting activated when we use a drug of abuse. Early days, we thought it was all about the reward pathway. Now we learn like that's just the very beginning of the story. Once we see someone addicted with compulsive behavior, it actually has very little to do with the reward pathway because by now, you know, at that point, the reward pathway is burned out and shut down. They're not producing much dopamine. Now this compulsive behavior is happening in the glutamate system and that's rewiring that happened in the prefrontal cortex. So like the part, you know, behind your forehead. And that's our part of our brain that is really like us, right? And us being humans in society, because it's our abstraction, our rationalization, kind of our version of our higher self, um, that we're like polite, sitting, having this interview, talking to each other, being very kind of like regular, regulating our behavior. All that conscious stuff is coming from the prefrontal cortex. So when that gets dysregulated, then you see out of control, irrational behavior, things aren't making sense, a person will say one thing and do another. And basically what we realize with addiction is that that's what's happening. So even though the person is walking, talking, they look normal, they don't look like there's anything wrong with them, their behavior is out of control because that prefrontal cortex is dysregulated. And I think because they don't, you know, for instance, um, with schizophrenia, you see people actively psychotic 
And now we get it. They don't have capacity, you know, to do right or wrong, et cetera. So we have to like look closer at it. Um, people with addiction are speaking logically. And so I think it's just harder for all of us as a society to say, this is somebody with dysregulated brain circuitry. It just doesn't look like it. And so we're at this point where it's 2021 now. And even though we've known this for 20 plus years, we're still treating addiction like it's something voluntary because it just looks voluntary to us. We can't like see inside and the person is walking and talking normally. Right. And that, that makes sense when you think about uh, how, what people, when you speak to people, especially like you said, deep in addiction, be, uh, quite often they're, they're in this, like, they don't want to live this way anymore. Like they'll tell you this, you know, this is terrible. And I, but they continue to do it. And then the people in, the, in their life are wondering, why don't you just stop? You're doing all these dangerous things and all these, uh, for lack of a better word, crazy thing, you know, like, you know, because yeah. their brain is, is miswired. Yeah. See, and and I, I love the way you explain that because that's really kind of, kind of uh, put, puts it in perspective in the sense that it's not necessarily a situation where you look at someone being a bad person or a, uh, a person who's, uh, you know, uh, Oh, you know, all the stigmatizing terms, which I don't want to use, you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. It, it's so fascinating too, because um, the more I work with addiction and I myself do not have a personal history of it, but the more I work with people who are addicted, it's like, it's almost like an extreme version of being a human. Like we all struggle with the same stuff. It's just like when you're actively addicted, that stuff is taking over your life and causing all these problems. And if um, I was on a panel with a former injection drug user recently, and I'll always talk about this kind of whole situation where when your brain is in that addicted state, um, you literally, you can feel the impulse arising from these primitive areas telling you to use and your prefrontal cortex will be like, no, I don't want to use. So you're having this internal war with yourself, but you'll like watch yourself use the drug anyway. And it seems almost like it doesn't make sense. And I asked this drug user and he was like, it's so weird. It was exactly like that. I'd be injecting myself with heroin, putting the needle to my arm and saying to myself, this is against my will as he's injecting. And so I think it's, it's like highlighting what we all know internally that we can have a war with ourselves. We can have things arise that are impulses or thoughts. And then there's another part of ourselves that is helping us decide, do we want to do that or not? And basically the willpower gets broken in addiction. So you're having this internal conversation with yourself. And even if you make a decision from your higher potential cortex, no, I don't want to do that. You go to stop yourself and you watch yourself unable to stop yourself. Like the brakes are just gone. And so it's this terrible internal experience for people. And the, the key here is that we're starting to think that that actually naturally activates shame. And this, we need more research, so I'm jumping a little bit by saying this, um, but the little research that we have shows that shame lives in the primitive cortex. And so we think when people are actively addicted, it's kind of naturally activating a shame response. And then they're watching themselves unable to keep a promise to themselves, right? Multiple, multiple times a day, feeling that urge arise, wanting to not do it, saying to themselves, I don't want to do it, and then watching themselves do it. So it's like, you're not able to trust yourself. And now you know that so many times over. And this is like, you can imagine the person is going through this mentally as they're getting addicted. By the time they show up to a clinician, it's been months to years of this. And so they're now soaked in shame. They've been in this huge battle. They're exhausted. And then they get to the provider and they're getting like, oh, why didn't you stop? I'm ashamed of you, et cetera, et cetera. So it's just like, they're so exhausted. And so we need to be completely empathic and just be like, welcome to treatment and like welcome them in rather than piling on or anything on top of it. Yeah, you know, I, I was thinking the one way that uh, that people can identify with that the average day person is is food. Almost everybody has some kind of food struggle. I myself definitely. I say I've I've lost and gained the same twenty five pounds for the past twenty five years, and forth. But it's that same cycle. Where, not to compare, you know, obviously addiction is so much it's, it's so much stronger. But a way that people can relate is you. You say, I'm not going to eat that cake. I'm not going to eat the cake. And there's the cake. You take one bite. Next thing you know, you ate a bunch. And what happens? You sit there hating yourself, feeling the shame. Why did I do that? And, and then all, you know, it can perpetuate. It can be a thing oh, going on and on and on. So I just, just for the average person, it's something people can, who don't have an experience of addiction can, can identify with. But what yeah. you've described is definitely how, uh, you know, working with ad people who are, are addicted all these years have, uh, have it described it very, very much the same way. So yeah. one thing I also appreciate about you, you know, you talk from a perspective of compassion, empathy, and the talk uh, and about as far as, so how can, how can family members, loved ones, how can, because it's frustrating to be a family member of, involved with someone who's, who's addicted. Watching, I said this to somebody recently, watching somebody destroy their lives is a, 
is a really it's like watching a movie where you know how it ends but you, you know you ever like i'm a big star wars fan and every time i watch the one episode where he becomes Darth Vader, i'm like don't do it come on stay good stay good anakin you know but he does it anyways and so it's really not to trivialize it but watching your family member go down that road is it's a painful experience so how can they put aside the feelings of frustration and all that comes with it and and go to a place of empathy and compassion and uh and all those things that we really need to nurture people who uh have problems yeah yeah um this is slightly related to it but it reminds me of this idea um it's called affect labeling and so if you have like an emotion inside you and you put a name to it and you label it it actually reduces the affect of it like it, it helps you stabilize and kind of contextualize it and so it's almost like entering things into a cognitive framework help us like calm down think clear not get so emotional kind of like it like organizes us a little bit and so I almost just think of it, um, if you learn the science behind addiction as a family member, you can understand, I would treat it like your relative has like schizophrenia or something else. Like that's much easier to kind of understand and say, oh, I get it. So it's like understanding what's happening in the brain. So even though they're walking and talking and looking normal and they're making all these terrible decisions, the reason for those terrible decisions is all this disrupted circuitry. And so it's kind of like putting that cognitive framework on it can help you step out of the emotions of the situation. Um, when, whenever I'm working, you know, psychiatrically in the hospital, we have somebody that's really escalated. I get really curious about like why they're yelling, why they're agitated, looking at the other staff, how are they interacting? It's like you want to shift into an observing mode and kind of like get out of a directly, because um, you don't want to be embroiled in some kind of like drama with the person. And, you know, this is friends and family. So, of course, your emotions are going to be part of it. You're going to get drawn in, et cetera. But as much as you can to kind of step back and look at it from the larger picture, um, and it's just really tough. We don't have any good answers because we don't have good access to treatment in this country. So most people have a really tough time getting specialty treatment. And so also just the awareness that in this country and in the world right now, people get farther down in addiction than they should because we don't have the societal resources to help them. So we, like, we're all struggling with people that are more severe than they should be just because there wasn't treatment for them to get earlier. Um, and then there, there are groups like Al-Anon and whatnot. Um, I don't, I don't love that they kind of take a very hands-off approach where they're like basically step back and let the person hit rock bottom, which if you're in, if you're kind of enmeshed with your family member, I think that could be a good approach, but there's other people who have stepped back and then something happened to their loved one and they actually regretted it and felt terrible about it. So I think it's actually a personal choice, kind of the way you want to engage with someone that's actively addicted. And it's not a one size fits all. And I think that's why there's no, you know, magic bullet of you, this is what you should do to get your loved one into treatment. It's incredibly complicated. It depends on their personality, your resources, your relationship. There's just so many factors. And so I think getting a professional involved, if possible, a counselor to help kind of, you know, clear the situation, this idea of like an intervention, like you just want to kind of clear the decks and think of another way to do it because all this stuff keeps so emotional. It's so incredibly emotional. It is. And I like what you said about looking at like schizophrenia and even taking it to another level. If somebody was was having hearing vision loss, you wouldn't be like, come on, why don't you try to see harder? You know, you or you know, or automatically when you see somebody who's on crutches, you more for them because you see that. But with addiction, you don't for whatever reason, you people are still go to that place of, you know, of that negative, the shame yeah. thing. Yeah, I've been I've been thinking just really quickly. I've been thinking of it almost like in the ED when you walk in and see somebody after a car accident. It's like bumps and bruises and broken bones, and everyone's rushing to the bedside and bandaging them, and then they get all this TLC and they recover, etc. And if you think about it, someone with addiction has all those same bumps and bruises, but they're internal and you can't see them. And so to almost imagine that person as you want to like picture them being broken so that you can understand that's why they're acting this way. Yeah, um, and to try to like hang on to that. Great. So if there was to to kind of sum it up, what if there was if there was if you had to give a couple of bullet points, what are some things that people should just know? I mean, you mentioned the brain and you know, understanding you know, that the, the prefrontal cortex is involved and you know there's a reason why the decision making is off. But what are what are to kind of sum it up, what are some things that everybody should just know about about addiction in, in today's, you know, if we want to understand it? Yeah. Um, a psychology intern I'm working with just said this recently, and I was like, I have to start using this. It's such a great quote. Um, but he said, problematic substance use is a trauma response. And that I think we need to like get ingrained and really, really understand it. Because even now in the field, like in the emergency room, 
when someone comes in addicted, we're more worried about how many bags of heroin did you use, how much cocaine, like documenting all this stuff, like it's all this focus on the substances, but we're missing the point that this person is using the substances because of underlying pain and trauma. So I think it's almost like we get too swept up in the drama of the behavior and the situation and all the craziness going on. But in reality, this is somebody that is struggling in a very deep way. And so when people are actively addicted, it's basically they feel trapped um, and then they feel like they have to keep doing the same thing. And if they go to stop and try to go through withdrawal, they don't have the mental resources and capacity to get themselves through it because they can't see what would be on the other side that is kind of worth it. And they just feel too like they're just not ready to kind of get through it. And so what we found is that empathy, compassion, connection, that's actually what you need to bring people back. That's the bridge to get them to see the light at the end of the tunnel and kind of bring them back into the social network. And if you look in the brain, this all makes sense because the OFC, it's like in your lower prefrontal cortex, that's your area of social cognition. And it makes you, it helps you decide who you want to hang out with. Literally, I want to go spend time with my child or my coworker, my friend. It's like socially navigating the world. When you're actively addicted, it gets rewired to make the drug a social relationship. So people are literally choosing to hang out with their friend, which is cocaine, heroin, or whatnot, and having the same warm feelings that they would have if they were with a friend. And so, and they, and then now you're in a bad relationship with that friend, right? You get a little bit of good out of them, but it's way less than you got before. And now it's terrible withdrawal, all this bad stuff, et cetera. So they want to break up with that friend, but then they go into withdrawal, they feel terrible, they go back for the comfort, and now they're stuck in this cycle. So we want to basically create healthy social relationships to give them, you know, help their OSC get reconstituted with regular stuff, right? But that's going to take time. So to expect that that's going to be a difficult transition for people, but we're designed to be social animals. Our whole brain is just designed to like, our prefrontal cortex rather, our like mammalian part of us is designed to hang out in groups and we're supposed to make eye contact and be bi-directional and help people and have people help us, et cetera. And when you're in active addiction, you get so isolated where you don't have those bi-directional relationships happening and they're usually not healthy. And so kind of creating that empathy and compassion for people to like give them the good stuff so they can see why to get sober. And then as they're getting sober, all that recovery support helps so much. And that's why we have 12 step fellowship. So that was created organically in like the 1930s from Bill Wilson with that idea. And it literally was just that he went and sat with um, the husband of somebody who he had like, he knew her and um, her husband had an alcohol use disorder. He went and sat with him to kind of counsel him for a couple hours. And he felt so much better after with lower cravings. And he realized if you help other people and we sit together and we talk about it, we'll all feel better. And people say after they go to an AA or an NA meeting, you like feel amazing after. And that's literally our neurobiology connecting with other people and you get into resonance with them and your pain, if you share it with them and they're empathic and they hear it, it literally reduces your pain. There's this area in the brain called the DACC, which is your distress associated with pain. And if you tell another person about your pain and they're nice to you about it and you feel like they actually care, your pain will feel less. So other people are literally a painkiller for each other, which we're literally in the middle of an opioid epidemic right now, right? And it makes perfect sense because we're also in late stage capitalism. <laughs> we're all isolated. We're all driving far to work. We're separated from our family. We're not living evolutionarily how we're meant to be. So people are hanging on by a thread. And then the rates of depression are through the roof. We have terrible income inequality. And now I just saw a statistic that we're over 100,000 overdose deaths. Just so it too. It's like just shocking. And now federally, they just came out and said they're going to embrace harm reduction at the federal I level because that. there's so many overdose deaths. So I think it's basically we've gotten to this really weird place in our society where we're the richest country in the history of the world, but we don't have health care. People aren't happy. 70% of the country lives paycheck to paycheck. We're like a very, we're like an impoverished nation, socially, financially, emotionally. And I think that's why we're having an opioid epidemic. Because if you take an opioid, it's going to kill your pain, both emotionally and physically, and you're going to feel like things are better. And, you know, a lot more people than we thought ended up getting addicted. But it's kind of that realization that people are addicted are also like a micro, they're kind of like a microcosm for what's happening in a larger global scale that people are really suffering. And so just to realize that all of this dysfunction comes from a place of trauma and pain. And so however you can kind of keep that in mind, that's going to help you interact with the person in so much more of a caring way with that undertone of caring rather than frustration. And sometimes also you just need to step back and have somebody else deal with it. So that's perfectly fine too. But I think it's very individual. Yeah, I, I agree wholeheartedly. We, we could definitely, get, that is a topic that needs to be talked about a lot more. This isn't just an opioid problem or a heroin problem or a drug. This is a world problem. This is, it is definitely 
it's never been a harder, I feel so bad for this generation coming up. It's never been a harder time to kind of navigate life. And that's why when I run group and things like that, I don't just talk about drugs, drugs, drugs. I talk about life. Let's talk about how to live and how to, how to make connections and how to, you know, do all the things that we need to do to be happy and to feel, because that's what recovery is about. You know, again, healing that, that, that part that's so, so great to end on. Absolutely. You know, and I always, that's why, again, once again, I always get so much out of listening to you and uh, you have so much to offer as far as, you know, I hope you, you keep get, going out there and doing what you're doing because it's, it's great stuff. So. Absolutely. Oh, wait, can I tell one other neurobiologist? You sure can. Thing? Go right ahead. This is one of my favorite things. And I actually have to research it a little bit more because I don't know the brain structures well enough. But um, but this factoid, like, changed everything for me. So your sense of self in your brain is completely overlaid with other people's perceptions. And so, like, the place where in our brain where we decide, like, this is me, that is all informed by how other people are treating you. They call it the evaluative reactions of others. So you're, when you're a conversation with people all throughout the day, everybody you meet, in the back of your mind, you're like, am I better than them? Am I worse than them? Do they like me? Do they not like me? How are they treating me? Are they respecting me? And so you add up all those little things all day, and that tells you literally who you are. And so if you have a day where everybody treats you like you're the best thing ever and you're amazing, you think you're amazing. If you have a day where everybody treats you like crap, you feel like crap. And so you can imagine somebody experiencing homelessness sitting in the street. What are the what are the encounters they've had over the past seven days with like police, passersby, et cetera? And then look at like the chair of a certain department at a hospital. What are the interactions that person had over the past seven days, right? And so just the realization that we're not islands in of ourselves. We're in this social soup and we're getting all, and we're obsessed with each other. And so all our information about ourselves is coming from other people. And so if you sit and give like dignity and respect to somebody that's struggling and like sit with them, make eye contact, have a real conversation and a connection, you're not only kind of helping them with whatever advice you're giving, you're literally showing them that they're important enough, that they're cared for, that they're loved, that it's worth you know your time to sit with them. Like all those things are in that interaction and it literally changes how they view themselves. And so that to me is so incredibly powerful. And so I think, and there's so much about the placebo effect in these antidepressant trials. They'll show that um, the antidepressant is like 40% effective. Placebo is like 30% effective. But to get a placebo, you have to have the doctor convinced and you have to have the doctor give it to the patient and have that whole therapeutic milieu happening. So we put a lot of emphasis on like medications and, you know, buprenorphine, yes, people absolutely need it. But I think a lot of what's happening in healthcare is that you have a doctor that cares and is sitting with a person who feels sick and they're transmitting like wellness through the social interaction in addition to whatever other interventions are happening. And the social interaction is probably more powerful in lots of ways because that's like literally what we're designed to be doing. And so just realizing that even by caring, running groups, sitting with someone, you're literally changing in their brain how they view themselves. So I just think it's so powerful and such a great way for clinicians to really realize the impact they can have. I, I agree 100%. I just said this to somebody recently because I do a lot of training with clinicians. And I think people, they expect too much of themselves as clinicians. They feel imposter syndrome. I'm not doing enough. But just... I, I've said this to clients, I've said this to other, other clinicians, just the fact that someone's coming to see you every week, that makes them try harder during the week. You know, I learned that when I was in, in I was a self-taught drummer and I never took lessons. And then somebody said to me, why don't you take lessons? I was like, all right, I already know. But so I was like, oh, they said, try the lessons. So I tried the drum lessons for a few weeks. And then the guy said, how'd you like the lessons? I was like, yeah, I didn't really learn all that much. And he's like, did you practice more? And I was like, yes. You know, just going, knowing there was someone checking with me every week made me try harder. So that it is yeah. th th that those connections mean so much. I, so I believe yeah. the doctor giving the pill, that interaction, if he's if he or yes. she friendly, it's a warm, uh, comforting environment. Of course, that's going to have an, uh, an effect. Exactly. Respond to, to connections of all kinds. You know what I mean? Yeah. You know, the, the you, you become friendly with the, the cashier at Wawa or whatever, you know, it, it becomes... Yeah this this positive experience every time you go there that someone says so, hello yeah. hey you know so and that's actually those little moments are our whole life like we we are like oh i'm looking for these big like i want to buy a house i want to have this whatever no your life is little interactions it's moment to moment so having that like warm interaction with the cashier here, literally made your day better, made their day better. So we should be having, as, like, we should just be focused on how many good interactions can I have every day? I just want to be happy every day. And the material stuff doesn't even matter. It's much more the interactions. 
And that's the interesting thing about addiction, because I feel like when people get into recovery, like they know that because they've gone to the brink of like life or death, they've struggled, they've been through this huge thing. And so it's like when they get in recovery, they have this amazing appreciation and joy for the little things. I was talking to a patient the other day who had been incarcerated and she said, I'm so grateful to have a light switch. I can turn on and off. And she's like, I'll literally just stand there and turn it on and off myself because the CLs were always in charge of the lights. So she could never turn on her lights on and off herself. And so it's like those little things. And if you're, if you take that cognitive moment to be grateful for it, your life will improve tremendously. It's so crazy. That's like, you will train yourself. And this is a whole separate thing about um, kind of mindfulness and the reticular activating system, but your brain is always just trained to be like, it's always looking on guard and trying to repeat experiences and making sure you don't get traumatized again. So it keeps you very contracted. And if you spend that moment to be positive and grateful and have a laugh with someone, release some good hormones, you know, just feel happy, your brain will literally look at the environment differently and start picking out good things to tell you about rather than staying in this contracted fear mode. So just as much as possible, we should try to be light, happy, laugh, be, you know, have fun. And that literally will help with recovery and like all human interactions. So in the end of the day, it's honestly just like being nice and fun with people. And that's the answer. No, it's, it's a, but it's, a, it's, a, it's an achievable answer if enough people get on board with it. Absolutely. And just be nice. It's, it's great. So, <laughs> yeah. So thank you so much. I, hey, you made me feel that way today. Thank you so much for giving me your time and attention to do this. I really, I'm honored to, to sit here and have this conversation with you today. So thanks. Thank you so much. And thanks. Thank you for listening. And uh, we'll see you next time. Perfect. Thank you so much. Take care.